we are going to um, have a fantastic conversation uh, that I'm going to start off and then my colleague, Thoral Barker, is going to lead and thrust on with uh, shortly. But we're going to um, 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 start off with a conversation about uh, cyber. So Matthew, you want to come and uh, join me here, um, uh, which is uh, um, uh, a very important conversation um, that we're going to have. Um, uh, if, if you feel um, uh, an inner anxiety about... Um, uh, if one of your employees is leaking uh, data about your company um, uh, to your detriment, uh, you are probably right to feel that anxiety. So, and that's what we're going to talk about uh, now. So, it is worth uh, uh, having a focus on this. Um, uh, uh, I'm delighted to be joined here by Matthew Moynihan, uh, someone I've got to know very well. He's the CEO of Forcepoint, uh, which is a, a company that. Um, uh, takes a very human-centric approach to managing digital risk. Uh, and we're going to dive into that uh, and then get into other subjects, including digesting the uh, President's uh, uh, speech. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for uh, bearing with us uh, while we... Uh, and, and, and by the way, when food arrives, you should eat. Yeah. It's not, please, do, we, we would welcome you also eating while uh, listening and joining in. So um, now I probably uh, speak for quite a few people in the room, if not all. Um, uh, how do we make as CEOs, how do we make something uh, cyber, something that doesn't keep us up at night? Yeah, it's pretty difficult to do. You know, uh, the role of a CEO is to see around the corner. And this is one discipline that's almost a dark art. Right. So it's very difficult uh, to do that. It's uh, come, as a CEO of a cyber company, I'm just mind boggled when you think about it. About a trillion dollars has been spent uh, on cybersecurity over the past seven years, and there's a 95% failure rate or success rate for the attackers. Um, if you think about it, any other critical industry probably would have been shut down by now. Right. And so uh, the uh, general counsel of the NSA came out a couple of weeks ago and uh, said uh, he, he, he could not overstate uh, the gap between the uh, growing cyber risk and the uh, ability to address it. And I'll t tell you a story why, just to bring it home. Uh, there was this true story, actually. A CEO of a Fortune 500 company in the Midwest uh, took a day off to take his son to a, a soccer game. Mm -hmm. And his son, fortunately, scored a goal. And uh, uh, he was very proud of him, doesn't use social media that much, but went home and posted on Facebook uh, that uh, he was so proud of his son. Uh, within five minutes, uh, Susan Johnson, the mother of one of his son's teammates, sent him an email uh, saying, I'm so proud uh, your son scored a goal. I caught it on my iPhone. If you send me your email, I will send you the video. And so he did. And it wasn't Susan Johnson. It was China. Wow. So uh, traditional cybersecurity couldn't stop that, mm -hmm. right? But that's when the game needs to begin. Right. And so I talk to clients a lot about if you're living in a home in a dangerous neighborhood and you know you can't lock your door, how would you protect your family? And naturally, they'll start talking about tripwires and flashlights, motion sensors, completely different technologies that we don't use today. Yeah. And so I think you're going to see the rise of behavioral-based systems. Obviously, a lot of talk about AI, but behavioral-based systems to get to know your employees, very similar to a Netflix and Amazon getting to know their customers and using it to protect you from the inside out as opposed to all the focus historically, which has been outside in. And just, just to set the expectation, will, will, will uh, these CEOs, companies ever be 100% safe? I mean, what, what sort of expectations should they have? No, I, I don't think so. Um, you know, clearly we're far from that now, um, but there's certainly precautions that you can take to you know, change the game. And I think you're starting to see that now with some of the more modern uses of technology. You know, it's, it's interesting when you look at the continuum, uh, you know, people use the word surveillance a lot uh, and they, they immediately think of nation state attacks. They use the word monitoring and they immediately think of big brother. But when you use the word protection, they feel comfort. It's the same technology underneath the hood that you're using. Uh, it's really how you use it and how you apply it to modern cyber threats. Um, and what, what trends are making it worse? It does seem to be on any survey we do, it seems to be number one or number two of the issues that our CEOs are facing. Um, uh, is, is, for example, moving to the cloud making this a, 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 a more of a concern for people? Is, is that what, what sort of trends are we seeing? Yeah, we've, we've heard the buzzword digital transformation. It's true. I mean, anything related to digitizing your business or taking once uh, in our, you know, sort of an older on-premise sort of headquarter-based model and moving it uh, to you know, one of mobility and remote workers and what have you. Is, is completely breaking the industry. Um, you know, the, the current state of affairs for, you know, some of the best practices uh, that were used by some of the leading companies like Equifax and 
and uh, you know Capital One and uh, even Target back in the day are are even being broken more uh, with remote users who are bypassing security controls, uh, data going to the cloud that's now not managed by your chief security officer. Uh, and so this uh, combination of uh, mobility and fragmentation of the infrastructure that you're actually running your business on has uh, really challenged uh, legacy architectures. To, to the extent that when that when our CEOs are thinking about a digital transformation project, when the, their CIO comes in and says there's an end of life situation, do, is it is it getting so risky that the costs of making such a transformation are beginning to outweigh the benefits? Well, the the costs are enormous. Uh, You know, you see the you know, and and the industry is responding, particularly in our GDPR and other you know, uh, you know, uh, various regulatory compliances. Mm -hmm. Security as a percentage of IT spend has gone from uh, one percent, you know, ten years ago to upwards of eight, nine, ten percent. I mean, phenomenal amount of money that's being spent, and um, it's not really made a dent, right? And so I think we need to reframe the issue and really start thinking about, um, okay, if we can't stop people from getting in. How do we hold anyone accountable that we've given rights and privileges to, to proper behavior with those rights and privileges? So, you know, it's no longer about getting in strong, understanding who's on the network and whether the intent of that person is for you or against you. Mm-hmm. And when you, when you think about it, um, all security has been historically around impersonation, mm-hmm. whether it's wire fraud, you know, check writing, fake checks, uh, tricking someone who's elderly on the phone into some scam. Mm-hmm. It's all about trickery. And uh, most, uh, if not all of the security issues outside of service disruption come from people. Mm. They're either external hackers that have gotten on, they're internal employees that have been hired and turned against your company. And surprisingly, most bad things happen to companies from good employees who are well-intentioned. They're just making mistakes in this click-first era. So let's talk about that. So so the main threats that people here are facing are good employees making mistakes and clicking on something that comes in from outside, right? That's the first. Yeah, but 70, 70% of all data leakage issues uh, are from employees who are making mistakes at work, whether it's they're tired or they're clicking on something that they're just so used to and conditioned to. Right. Quite high up the list is, is an employee with bad intention, though. So you're seeing that. I mean, you go, uh, this is uh, increasingly the case. Uh, obviously, you've seen a lot of press around uh, nation state attacks on intellectual property and leapfrogging generational technologies. That is certainly the case. I mean, there's some high profile cases around Tesla, uh, Intel, uh, others who have been compromised. You don't have to disclose it, so it's not talked about as much, but by far, uh, the greatest economic damage is coming from blueprints. Uh, and just just so, remind people who may not know, just remind us some of the basics of the Tesla, the, the couple of Tesla. Yeah, Tesla's sort of fascinating. It's, uh, it's all public knowledge. But uh, two things happened to Tesla, and there's uh, several uh, court cases happening right now. One was around an insider who uh, got access to the autopilot uh, technology, which is a crown jewel of Tesla. And then two, uh, there was another insider who was uh, upset at uh, Elon, who was stealing... Uh, production data and scrap data and giving it to Wall Street analysts that ultimately led to the stock price going up and down and then Elon sending that famous tweet. Uh, but there's really economic, this, these are all people who are on the network for years prior to that happening. And, and so building on that then, what are the telltale signs for people in the room to watch out for, for an employee who may be going bad? What, what sort of things would, would they be looking for? Well, m- most of the damage outside of service disruption, obviously we saw Saudi Aramco, a drone being flown over an oil plant, and you know, it's very, very difficult to s- stop that. Physical attacks aside, um, most uh, of the bad uh, behavior has an intent to steal something. And it's critical data or intellectual property. And so what you're seeing, Lockheed Martin came up with some time ago, the concept of a kill chain, the complete end-to-end continuum of reconnaissance down to, uh, down to uh, data theft. The new model is a behavioral kill chain, looking for an employee or an adversary who's masquerading as an employee, the steps they're taking to hoard data. Uh, that could be printing one page per day of account information to a printer, uh, it could be sending something to your personal email. It could be sending something to a cloud property like Box or Dropbox. All of these have fingerprints of behavior, and so uh, the new the, the new uh, you know term that you know CEOs are working uh, boardrooms are now addressing isn't so much dwell time. How long has an adversary been dwelling? It's time to exfil, and the exfil is happening far greater and far faster than anyone can catch them.
Mm. Right. And so it's it just a, the paradigm shift has to be completely turned on the head. And in that behavioral kill chain, any other examples? I mean, why transfers, example, for example, if people are... Well, it's interesting now you're starting to see some very sophisticated companies in the financial space start integrate new types of data streams to understand stressors. Mm. You know, one of the number one tells that somebody is going to do something bad is a wire transfer. Mm. There's some physical stressor in that person's life. The time sensitivity to it uh, could be something that's personally sensitive. They don't want to be known. And so you're starting to see all types of new data sets um, being incorporated then to understand risk of an individual. It could be performance reviews. It could be we have one uh, bank who's giving us credit card information and giving travel information to see if the person's in the same location where they're spending or not. And this is not um, you know anything, anything that's earth shatteringly new. I mean, the banks do this all the time. You know, how many, how many of us have had our credit cards blocked when we're traveling overseas? I mean, CEOs with a credit card is the last person you should be blocking, yeah. right? But they don't know you well enough, despite the sophisticated technology that they have. Oh, very strange. I had my car blocked just yesterday. <laughs> um, uh, final question. Let's get, make it very practical for people. What's the one thing you should all, these people should all do next week when they get back from Davos to improve their protection against cyber attacks? So, you know, one longer term thing, just go, go back and talk to your chief security staff and ask if you've got visibility into behavior, pre-breach behavior. Most of them will say no, but it will really, really begin a dialogue inside of the company. Okay, more practically, I would uh, really go and look at your data protection program. Okay, so I think you're going to see over the next five to 10 years, people try to get left a breach, which is understand risk before the breach. But until we get there, you really have to have a robust data protection program to understand, do I have a single policy on end users between on-premise and the cloud? And then the last one I would say, this has clearly been borne out by Equifax and others, is make sure you have a proper response plan. You can save hundreds of millions, if not billions, of economic value for your company just by responding properly in a unified way. And those should be in place today. And so, I would, you know, one, that, that one, two, and three could probably save a lot of, uh, uh, prevent a lot of risk from coming into your business. Uh, Matthew, I could speak to you for hours about this. Thank you so much. Appreciate We're going to crack you. on, though. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you.